So moving from governance, let's talk about risk and making risk assessments and generally risk management within the GRC framework. NIST 830 provides a framework for conducting risk and managing risk. So if we look at this diagram down here, we have this center section, which is referred to as frame, and this is essentially framing risk, which for the organization means understanding risk. What is, what is a problem we're trying to understand or frame that risk? How do we convey what this risk is? Once we know that something presents a risk, we can assess it. To what degree of risk does it present to the organization? Once we understand to what degree that risk poses to us, once we've assessed it, we can begin responding to it. And our response to that risk will change how we frame that risk. We might not be able to mitigate the risk entirely, we might be able to reduce the risk in half, but that changes how we frame that problem. So this, this cycle of framing and understanding risk to the organization, assessing to what degree the risk presents, and how do we respond to that risk dictates or in turn turns it into a new risk that we must handle and be aware of. Now, once we're aware of what risks we need to monitor and be aware of, we, of course, monitor them. And the monitoring of that risk helps us assess that risk over time. What if a new vulnerability is present in the organization? Well, that changes how we frame that risk. The risk is different. And that, again, goes back into the assessment, response, and monitoring process. So it's a cyclical process of understanding our risk assessing the risk, responding to it, and monitoring the effectiveness of our risk response strategies and ensuring that that risk stays within an acceptable level that the organization is willing to risk. So talking more about risk assessments, we've got to have a methodology. So the NIST 800-30 framework provides an overview of risk methodology. And again, this is another it depends kind of framework. When you read a lot about NIST and a lot of what the things it recommends, they're very generic. And that's also a blessing and a curse. It allows organizations to adhere to the NIST resiliency framework and cybersecurity models based on how they operate, what they do, and how they define risk. At the same time, it doesn't provide really clear cut and dry you're doing a good job, you're doing a bad job. Because you doing a good job or bad job really lies in part of with your assessment of your organization. One organization might consider something to be high risk that another organization considers to be low risk. So there is no real standard in what is good or bad to within a degree. There is a huge gray area there. So again, this document provides us this risk assessment methodology, and it starts out with organizational risk frame. Again, going back to how do we frame risk? How do we understand risk? And that helps to determine how are we going to assess that risk? How Once the risk has been framed, how are we going to assess it? And that is easier said than done because every risk is different. Assessment of a risk requires data. It requires knowledge and it requires insights into past behaviors and activity. So without any of those, it's really hard to assess risk. So once we know what a risk is framed as, what is, what is it, what does it look like to the organization, we can create a methodology to assess it. And in that methodology, we have a risk assessment process. We have a model. Essentially, a model is what data are we going to include and how are we going to assess that data to make a outcome about what this risk is to the organization or what level of risk this risk presents to the organization. We have our approach. How are we going to approach this assessment? What data are we going to use? What people do we need? How long is it going to take? What tools do we need? Analysis approach. How do we calculate risk? If we run it through an algorithm and it spits out a number, what does that number mean? How do we rate good versus bad trends over time? So all of these things present in of themselves problems that need to be accounted for and, and tackled. Once an organization assesses these processes, they now have a defined risk assessment methodology that they can use themselves. And last but not least, we need to account for our risk model variables. The variables can differ depending on organization to organization, but generally speaking, it requires an understanding of the threats, how those threats shift over time as the adversary learns, adopts, and uses new techniques and technology, that threat shifts. What vulnerabilities exist in the organization? 
technology, people, processes, all can represent a vulnerability. How does that play into our model? Predisposing, what, what vulnerabilities or issues existed in the organization prior to this identified risk? Did we know it was a problem before we even assess this risk? Is it something that can't change? Can it be changed? Predisposing conditions? Likelihood, how likely is this to occur again? An impact, what would be the impact of this occurring or this taking place? And as you saw in our other video, when we talked about risk, our calculation of threat times vulnerability times impact gives us a risk assessment. We can see this is a more detailed breakdown, still not very detailed, but it provides us a little bit more insight into what that limited algorithm uh, did not. We can see that our threat source with characteristics where we account for the threat's capability, their intent, what are they going to do, how do they operate, provides us an understanding of the threat event. What is the likelihood of this threat event occurring? An advanced persistent threat with these capabilities are likely to cause this type of activity or event to occur. And it will look like these behaviors or sequence of actions, activities, or scenarios. We'll know what it should look like based on intelligence, based on what's happened in our organization in the past, but it requires some level of understanding, right? It's hard to do a risk assessment within this model if we don't understand what type of threat event may occur. That leaves the organization wide open to a great deal of, of risks. So once we understand what that event looks like, what would that event do if it was applied to the right vulnerability? Because just because there's an advanced threat out there and they have a certain type of capability or action or activity that they're undertaking still doesn't mean they're ultimately going to impact or cause an issue with their organization. There must exist a vulnerability within the organization. The people that work for the organization aren't trained in identifying phishing emails. Well, that's a vulnerability. So if we have a threat source that uses phishing emails to email our users, we've got a threat source, we've got the event, the type capability they're using, and our users unaware of what phishing emails are, clicks a malicious link or downloads a malicious file, they've taken advantage of a vulnerability. The impact is the outcome of that user, the vulnerability, clicking on that link or downloading that file and executing it. What happens? Is the system compromised? Does the user's credentials get stolen? Does their credit card get stolen? Uh, is it ineffective? Who knows? We have to assess that. But those are the scenarios we need to look at and account for to understand how this risk model provides us an assessment of that risk. And you can see in vulnerability, we have that predisposing conditions. What conditions already existed that might not be able to be mitigated? We can't upgrade this operating system because it's old but it's being used and it generates a lot of money for the organization, so it just has to exist. Uh, this has definitely occurred. I've seen it many times where there's really old servers that are doing mission critical work and there are no more security patches for that system. It is an unsupported operating system. We can't update it, we can't patch it, but it exists and it needs to exist. So it's a predisposing condition where we have a completely vulnerable server that we can't patch or update and it presents a huge vulnerability and there's not much we can do about it. So as you'd imagine, that changes our risk model greatly when we can't change it through traditional means of vulnerability patch management. Once we understand the impact of that vulnerability being taken advantage of, we can begin understanding our organizational risk. Once we understand our organizational risk, we can start working and blending that risk into our governance strategy. We know our risk, we know our risk acceptance, we can begin drafting mitigation strategies, risk transference strategies, risk avoidance strategies, and how that aligns with our budget, security integration with business units, how do we get support from those business units to allow us to update their systems or replace that really old server and operating system. All of these things have to work in concert and they all have to be agreed on between a lot of different people with a lot of differing views on how security should be done. And at the end of the day, this is why governance is important. We've got to be able to hear everybody's strategies and approaches, but there's got to be 
one person or a group of people who enforce governance. They are the decision makers. They drive the strategic vision. They ensure that things are done on time and in, in line with our objectives for the organization and in budget. So at the end of the day, sometimes we have to just shut up and color. And that's unfortunate, but security isn't the end-all be-all to an organization's success.